Joining me right now is Dr. Kathy Eng. She's an oncologist at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center in Nashville. And she is also one of the doctors leading the charge and looking at this growing trend of early onset colorectal cancer, which is something that my husband had. He was only 47 when he was diagnosed. So Dr. Eng, thanks so much for being with me here so we could talk about some of the things that you're learning. So why don't you go ahead and just tell us what is early onset colorectal cancer and what did you start seeing in your practice years ago, the, the trends with your patients? Um, I started noticing development of early onset colorectal cancer when I was um, starting my practice. Um, I've been an oncologist um, since 2002, out of training since 2002, and um, practice for, have been in practice almost two decades, obviously, at this point. And I thought I was just seeing a large number of patients originally because I was at a large referral center. Um, however, I was seeing more and more patients and I was also seeing more and more patients in later stages of disease, often metastatic, um, because they would be too young to be screened. And so when I originally um, started looking at the research at that time, this, was, this has been an interest of mine for over 10 years, um, the literature did not support that these patients um, fared any differently than average age patients. So just to keep things in perspective, the average age patient in the United States is 67. And yet I was seeing patients in my clinic without inherited form, an inherited form of colorectal cancer, which is less than 5% of the patient population. Um, I was seeing patients in their 20s. My youngest patient was 16. Um, and, um, and the majority of my patients, though, were between 30 and maybe early 40s. And the average screening age at that time was 50 years old if you did mm -hmm. not have a known inherited um, risk factor. And the literature at that time suggested there were two papers out, um, and they suggested that based upon the available literature, these patients did not fare any differently than the average patient. But what I was seeing in my clinic was that these patients actually were not able to be on chemotherapy as long as my average age onset patients. I don't like to call them older age patients, the yeah. average age onset patients. Mm -hmm. My career continued to develop, and obviously I was seeing more and more patients. And um, that's actually part of the reason why I wanted to create a um, program focused on the needs of young adult patients. So here at Mandible Ingram Cancer Center, um, it's not just a colorectal young adult program. It is a young adult cancers program for all young adults between the ages of 20 and 45. Because I, I don't know if it's just colorectal cancer. I suspect we're going to start seeing some other cancers um, with earlier onset, but that obviously because because colon cancer is a much more common cancer, it's, it's more evident. So I guess the big question is, why is this happening? Why are we seeing yeah. this increased instances? Is it environment? Is it diet? Is it um, antibiotic use? Is it everything all rolled into one? What has the research started to show us? Are we not at that point yet? So we have lots of theories. Um, there is some literature out of the UK that suggests that prior antibiotic use, which of course may impact the microbiome, um, may um, be associated with early onset colorectal cancer. There is extensive data regarding um, obesity and change of body weight um, from like when you're 18 up until you're an adult. Um, that is also associated with colorectal cancer. Um, there's obviously some associations that have been reported with diabetes. Um, so I, I would have to say it's definitely multifactorial. Um, is it all environmental? I can't say for sure. Um, is it partially diet? I suspect some of it is a component, but once again, we don't have any hard facts. We have lots of um, interesting data. Um, and can we pinpoint the best way to prevent this at this time? No. I would have to say we don't have a good answer at this time. We're continuing to still evaluate the data. And it's also important to keep in mind that it takes historically, based upon average age patients, it takes five to eight years, maybe 10 years for a polyp to become cancerous. So if we're seeing a young adult patient in their, let's say 35, then they may have had a polyp starting in their late 20s, early 30s. Is it and something that- and they would not be screened then. So that leads me to my next question. It's sometimes, is it um, more communication with our primary care physician that when a younger person comes in, that they should be thinking about the potential for colorectal cancer instead of saying, oh, well, you're too young, wait until you're 45, or still the mentality is over 50, Kathy. Yeah, so, so that is, um, 
so that is what I'm trying to emphasize whenever I give the lecture and through um, any of the publications we have regarding young adults. Um, because we don't can't identify the exact etiology for the development of sporadic early onset colorectal cancer, I've been constantly trying to educate individuals to please get screened or request some type of screening. Any type of screening is better than none. Um, mm -hmm. If a patient has persistent symptoms that do not go away, you know, after a couple of weeks. Tell us those symptoms, what we should be looking for. Yeah. So um, I'll give you a good example. I just met a young woman recently and um, she had been having blood in her stools for a, the past few months and was constantly told it was hemorrhoids, um, but it was not getting better. It was actually getting worse. And she was the one that actually requested from her primary care physician to get a colonoscopy. And in fact, she has colon cancer. Um, so um, the symptoms that patients often um, note early on, so the, so, so I think it's also important to keep in mind, some people, unfortunately, a lot of people say this to patients, oh, you don't look like you have cancer. But the reality is, is that we don't want the patients to already look like they have cancer. Before that means it could out. be already, it could be already very advanced. Yes. It, the tendency is if they already look unwell, weak, loss of weight, um, and other symptoms, such as pain, then they probably have more advanced disease. We want to catch the patients while they're still, um, you know, asymptomatic, relatively asymptomatic, um, and look healthy um, and feel well because they're going to tolerate their treatment better. Um, so, so the more, more common symptoms we hear this all the time is, I thought it was irritable bowel disease. I thought it was hemorrhoids. So they have mm -hmm. uh, uh, irregular bowel motility, change in bowel habits, change in the caliber of their stools or size of their stools incomplete evacuation, which is what I call it, where you, you can't um, have a bowel movement fully and you have multiple small bowel movements. And then of course, blood in the stool, um, change in the color of the stool, a more advanced disease is more commonly associated with night sweats. Sometimes um, people will be at their primary care physician's office and their doctor will say, oh, you're anemic. And then if it's a woman, they presume it's due to their menses or their periods, um, the menstrual periods. But in fact, um, if, if this is a persistent issue and they do iron deficiency studies and you don't have any other etiology to account for it, I would suggest that that be worked up. In a gentleman, it is not normal to be iron deficient when you're young, um, unless you have some strange dietary habits that you're not getting adequate nutrition. Um, I shouldn't say strange, but inadequate dietary yeah. habits where you're not getting the right nutrition. It's absolutely, my husband, that was the only symptom he had. He was anemic. And the and and his, the levels were low, and that's what triggered them saying, you know what, we should get you a colonoscopy. And he already had advanced disease. Then when he was when he was diagnosed, you know, one thing, Kathy, too, that we also experienced, and that you are working with with younger people, is sometimes we were the youngest people in the waiting rooms. We were yes. the youngest people in clinic. We were the youngest people in trial, and that can have a different, a kind of, I think, psychological effect um, yes. on how young people then move through cancer if they do get no evidence of disease or they're in remission. How are you working with younger people in dealing with a cancer diagnosis and all of the different financial things and, and livelihood things that go along with it? Um, thank you for asking that question. That is the exact reason why um, uh, we created the Young Adult Cancers Program here at Vanderbilt. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, for at least in colorectal cancer, our average age patient is 67. So these patients have, um, for the majority of people, have been married or have, uh, have a family, have had established careers, um, have you know accomplished a lot of their goals they hope to achieve in their lives. Whereas with our young adults, um, depending upon their age, some of them have just graduated um, from college, some have just gotten um, their graduate degree, now they're dealing with financial stability, or they've just recently married or met someone and they're thinking about family planning. And then this has come completely unexpected and has changed their entire world given the diagnosis and depending upon the stage of disease, especially in that setting. And even with early stage disease, you, you, you may still have other issues in regards to dealing with some of the toxicities associated with therapies, mm -hmm. especially if you needed radiation treatment. So my whole purpose was really to create a program where patients did not feel alone and they realized they were not the only individual um, with early onset disease. So our focus, and I'm so grateful for our patient advocates who are all um, uh, survivors, thrivers, 
um, who have experienced this firsthand and have provided us great feedback. But we have created a board of directors, and that was my purpose, to focus on each of as each aspect that a young adult may face. Um, whether it's financial hardship, whether it's body image, whether it's bowel motility issues, whether it's um, nutrition issue, whether it's about family planning. Um, and I hate to bring it up, but it has to be brought up end of life discussion or yeah. um, advanced power of, um, power of attorney, um, advanced directive, sorry, power of attorney. Mm -hmm. so, so we have individuals as part of our group that we're so passionate about helping young adults. Um, and that's where I feel so grateful um, that I have people to work with me to help our young adults um, address the, these issues as best as possible. It is not the first visit that this usually goes over well. They're overwhelmed, all the patients and their um, family members and spouses are overwhelmed Ooh. on the first visit. This is not what they were expecting. And, and to have that discussion about consideration of fertility planning and family planning. Um, you know, they may have just been recently married and it's, it's, it's a very difficult and emotional subject for patients. When we look out, and I think it was this statistic that got me that I saw in eight years by 2030, colorectal cancer is going to be the number one cancer killer of adults aged 20 to 49 in eight years. That is a staggering statistic, Kathy. What do people, I say anybody who is over the age of 20 and has a colon needs to know what's happening in terms of research and the knowledge that we're getting right now. What would you say people need to know about screening, about looking at their lifestyle and where they should go from here, ages 20 to 49? Um, I would always say any adult, especially um, from 20 to 49, please get a primary care doctor. Um, please get your annual, annual physical examination. Uh, please communicate to your physician if things are, um, if you do not feel well, if something is unusual from your, your baseline, um, please follow up on, on it. Don't presume um, it is something completely benign. Um, if something does not resolve in regards to symptoms that you may be having, you really need to have it addressed. 